For those who crave their first long-distance adventure, and for those who carry the memories of one, may my journey serve as both a spark to set you in motion and a reminder of roads already traveled. This was my road to Talamina. Furthest I've ever attempted on a motorcycle. Straddling the border of Arkansas and Oklahoma is a roller coaster of asphalt carved through the ancient Owashita Mountains. For 50 miles, it twists and turns along razor's edged ridges, climbing to some of the highest points between the Rockies and Appalachians. It's a place where the horizon seems endless, where the road climbs and falls like the breath of the land beneath you. I set out from central Louisiana with a goal to push myself and my bike further than ever before. 300 miles stood between us and the winding staircase, with another 300 between heaven and home. A daunting distance for my first long ride. My only companion was a small, single-cylinder dual sport, a machine with a heart big enough to take on the open road, but just small enough to make me question its limits. Could we conquer steep climbs, dance with other unforgiving machines, and push through miles of winding pavement with just one cylinder thumping? Like many of my viewers, I've been a lone rider ever since I hopped on my first machine. It's a different kind of freedom, one where every mile brings you deeper into your own thoughts and the road becomes a silent teacher. How you navigate through the moments of isolation, how you deal with the unexpected, and how you embrace a challenge when there's no one else to rely on. Shattered blacktop tests your muscle memory, blind corners your self-control, and long stretches your endurance. Now here, far from the safety of home, there's little margin for error. A distance this deep into unfamiliar territory, along with hard limits on time, funding, and space for tools means that anything this little hawk powers into, it will need to power out of. A constant reminder of the strong possibility that a failure out here means my bike may never see home again. I was told the Talamina fall colors stretch out like a sea of gold and crimson. Beautiful, but indifferent to the struggles of a lone rider on a machine built for much smaller adventures. Each ascent will push the engine to its limits, every descent test the brakes. The constant battle between road and rider will blur the lines between thrill and peril, where one mistake can, and for others has, ended the journey. So I've been told.
Could this little bike endure the long climbs after having already pushed over 250 miles to get here? Let's find out. Planning this trip was about finding roads that match my bike's limited top speed while promising the best scenery along the way. A quick tune-up and inspection the day before, plus one last check of my tools and supplies were all I could do. In the back of my mind, though, were persistent worries. Wondering if I had what it would take to fix any of the countless things that could go wrong. In the end, I had no choice but to rely on my bike's proven reliability to keep those worries in check and take things one bridge at a time. Since the beginning of my journey on small displacement two-wheeled machines, I've been captivated by how far you can push these little engines and still make it home. Each ride has carved its own story into my mind, a mix of joyful victories and frustrating setbacks. Learning to battle the quirks hidden in these bikes just to uncover the rewards they have to offer has left me with memories I'll never forget and almost no regrets. All right, 300 miles to go, 600 mile round trip. Don't usually need the choke to start this girl, but it is a bit chilly this morning, so I'm just gonna have it on anyway. guys a quick overview of the bike and this nice light in here before I turn on my GPS <laughs> gonna be tricky to get on and off she's already a tall bike and I got all that stuff on there I'm, uh, I'm gonna test this out for a little bit of the trip and who knows maybe it'll stay that way but I'm gonna try and use my backpack here, which I've carefully strapped in just the right way where I can hopefully use it as a backrest. We'll see how that goes. Tool parts kit. A few uh, necessities in case we get a flat or something breaks. Hopefully that'll take care of us. We got an extra two liters of gas. This tank does have a reserve as well. I, if my memory is right, it's like about three gallons. Minimum clothes, I got a hammock for camping, hopefully we'll camp. NOS to start me out early, got my charging going on, everything's looking good. Tire pressure's looking good, it's a little low right now just because it's so cool, but that will come up to about 32 PSI. That oil cooler is hopefully going to put in some work for us. I don't suspect I'll be using the auxiliary lights at all, but if I run across uh, some really dark back road or an individual who just refuses to turn off their head high beams, <laughs> that might come in handy. Uh, we're at 5,600 miles on the Hawk, to, Hawk X250. Now the, the bulk of the trip is 300 miles one way, 300 back, 600 round trip. But obviously we're probably going to be adding a lot more onto that because there are so many places to explore in the Ozark, or in the Arkansas and Oklahoma mountains. Anyways, let's get going. It's easier to use the peg and climb over this side than to try and swing my leg up over that. I learned that trick from Fort Nine. Blew my mind when he showed it to me. All right, 300 miles, here we go. At 4 a.m. on a Thursday, I set off, earlier than planned. Sunrise was still three hours away, so night riding it would be. 
Restless excitement paired with years of working the night shift left me with two choices. Stay in bed and wait, or push through the quiet, starlit darkness ahead. I chose the ride. I took an early break at a small municipal fire station to rest my nerves. The deep silence of this country road was a blunt reality check for the ride ahead. To accommodate for the frequent stops I had planned, I aimed to cover about 40 miles each hour, holding an average speed of 50 miles an hour. This little dual sport can hit 60, and there were times when the open road called for it, but knowing we were in it for the long haul, I held back whenever the road would allow. Until recently, my adventures were limited by all the usual obstacles, ones I'm sure many of us know well. For years, I watched others explore places I could only dream about, waiting for the chance to see them myself. Not to take away from the smaller adventures I've enjoyed along the way, but I haven't seen mountains in over a decade. I want to climb so high that I can look out and see both where I'm going and where I've been. I want to feel the goosebumps that come when you crest a peak, seeing a horizon so vast it defies your own sense of depth, reminding you just how big this world really is. I know the freedom of writing in my stories, I use a lot of metaphors, but this is quite literal. It's a craving I've had for a long time. As dawn broke, I was met by a fresh, unfamiliar view. A world waking up around me as I had already crossed close to a hundred miles. The optimism was as steady as the morning light, and the bike, true to form, was performing as confident as usual. By the time the sun fully joined me, I felt like we were already a part of this landscape. Fuel stations were a welcoming sight along the way. They were a good excuse to resupply, even when not necessary. For me, they acted more as a checkpoint, offering a guaranteed place to rest and recharge. We are at our first stop in Arkansas, just a stretch. There's nothing special here that I know of, but this town is called Emerson. A uh, bike is doing good. The only issue I'm having with it is if I'm holding a steady cruise about 50 miles an hour for a long time if I uh, just pull in the clutch and let off the gas she'll stall so something with the idle circuit uh, however if I just engine brake uh, instead then usually by the time I get down to about third gear I can pull in the clutch and she'll keep up The morning mist slowly retreating from the rising sun. It felt almost as though it was being chased back by the low, lion-like growl of the bike. A sound that carried us forward and seemed to be a part of the world. My riding gloves, a necessary shield for comfort and safety, made capturing some of the passing beauty a challenge. The loss of precision in my fingertips meant that finding the camera's record button was difficult and some moments slipped by just out of reach. I couldn't have asked for better riding conditions. Midweek and midfall promised a peaceful stretch of road with only the trees to witness my journey, for the most part. The autumn's leaves blazed in reds and golds, a perfect sea of colors to dive into, while the forecast, as if giving its own blessing, 
promised cool mornings, warm afternoons, and a gentle breeze along every mile. Discovering new small towns along the way is always a treat, for a number of reasons, but one of them that I often wonder is living in a small town myself, is there an individual here somewhere that can relate to my situation and maybe is preparing for their own adventure themselves? Who knows? We cross countless creeks and rivers along the way, but one that caught my attention and I had to check out was the Little Missouri River. I was born in Missouri and lived there until I was 12. Of course, this being in Arkansas, it's likely that the only relation is the river's origin. Still, it was a pleasant surprise. I'd never seen this much care given to an underpass before. As the road carved through the crest of a hill, the landscape shifted into something I'd almost forgotten. The first cut of hard rock appeared, raw and exposed, signaling our arrival into the rugged heart of Arkansas. Louisiana's softer soil never offered sights like these. I pulled over to take in what my childhood once took for granted, appreciating not just the weathered beauty, but what it meant for this journey. The rough stone brought back memories of family road trips, grounding me in just how far we had already come. It felt like a milestone that meant more than any mile marker ever could. Only a few miles past our first rocky cutouts, the land began to transform. Rolling hills rose up, slowly taking on the shape of small mountains. With each new crest, I found myself looking over the tops of trees, the road unfolding into the distance like an invitation. This was the view I'd been waiting for. Back in Louisiana, the flatlands kept the world small, bounded by the tree line. Here, though, the land opened up, giving me glimpses as far as the eye could reach. For me, this felt like the true beginning of the trip. Even with miles ahead, my mind was focused on the road and the scenery, leaving the clock behind. Time seemed to stretch and shrink with each turn, reaching that all too familiar point in every biker's adventure where the journey starts to feel less like a destination and more like its own reward. As I continued riding, stunning recreation areas began to appear with such frequency that it was almost overwhelming. Each one seemed to ask me to slow down, to breathe in the scenery, and to let the beauty sink in. I wanted to explore them all, but time forced me to choose carefully. The few places I did manage to visit were worth every spare second I could give. One of the most memorable spots was Bear Creek at Lake Greeson. Its clear, calm waters stretched out like glass, surrounded by gentle, sloping forest, perfectly quiet and framed by rolling hills that seemed almost untouched. Further along, the Albert Pike Recreation Area off of Highway 369 offered a different kind of beauty. Its dense pines, rocky streams, and winding trails that flowed like the Little Missouri River. This place was wild and timeless like stepping into a postcard from the heart of the Oashita Mountains. Though each stop took me further from my schedule, I knew they'd left a mark, adding places to my journey that will call me back, inviting new adventures in the future. There's, uh, <clears throat> there's way too much to record here, and I gotta save my space and batteries for the main mountain ridge. But um, 
if you guys live in Arkansas or Oklahoma, you've got to check this place out. It is amazing. You guys want to see what some extra spicy cheese grater pavement looks like. Stuff's like grip tape. Probably like a rally car's dream. But you do not want to go down on that stuff. As we neared what would be our base camp in the town of Mina, I could feel my energy slipping, my eyes growing heavier with each mile. The road had been smooth and steady, great for comfort and control. But the vividly haunting thought of taking a spill on these rocky shoulders lingered in the back of my mind. Thankfully, Arkansas's cool, clear streams offered the perfect place to recharge. A few splashes of cold water on my neck jolted the senses awake, just enough to give me the boost I needed to stay alert and press on towards Mina. Here's a little tip for you guys. If you go to a hotel and you forget to pack your charger to plug into the wall, but you've at least got your cable, hotel cable boxes usually have a charge port. There's two USBs on here. And the TV has at least one. So that's, uh, that's three charge ports for you. Ooh. There you go. Busy and completely unaffected by my arrival, this small city at the base of the mountains held its own quiet allure, tempting me to explore. But my mind was set. First, book a room. Then, check my gear. And finally, strike a deal with the Sandman for what promised to be one of the best night's sleeps I had had in years. Anyway. Oh! Ha 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 ha. Ah. Now that's a window. I'd never been so grateful to be woken up by noisy neighbors. Opening my eyes to bright light and seeing the sun already pushing through the curtains gave me a flash of dread, but only for a moment. It was the perfect timing to capture Golden Hour, blending its warm light with the fiery colors of fall. I quickly loaded the bike, fueled up, stocked up on drinks and snacks. The anticipation of seeing a view I hadn't glimpsed in years surged through me stronger than any morning coffee. And finally, there it was. The first stretch of road climbing into the mountains. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the near perfection of the Talamina Scenic Byway. Driving to these places by car has always been an option, but it would lack the challenge that makes it so much more satisfying. While the beauty here is undeniable no matter how you arrive, there's something different about pulling up to a grand vista and dismounting a worn but reliable machine. It's a feeling that words and video can't quite convey, something you have to experience for yourself. It's bliss, pure and overwhelming. 
to the point where the thought of leaving this place feels like leaving a part of yourself behind. Little did I know before arriving that the byway had even more gifts in store. Every few miles treated us to not only priceless views, but the purpose of the road itself seemed crafted for those seeking the same experience. With no through traffic to break the peace, only travelers looking to soak in the journey joined us on the winding path. Minimal signage kept distractions at bay, and the generous 55 mile an hour speed limit suited my bike perfectly. Fast enough for the thrill seekers, yet slow enough to enjoy every sweeping vista. Not once did I find myself holding anyone up or being held back. It was as if an unspoken agreement passed between us all, a mutual respect for the road and the journey. In the early morning light, the vistas were magnificent, the traffic sparse, and the experience unforgettable. This was, without question, the best 50 miles I have ever ridden. For me, this journey was planned as a quick two-day adventure, but the unexpected treasures we uncovered turned this into more of a scouting trip. There's simply too much here to take in fully. The camping, the recreational spots, the historical sites along the byway, all demanding far more time to appreciate them than I'd allowed. And that doesn't even include the remarkable places we found on the way here. I completely underestimated what this trip would reveal. Make no mistake, I'll be back better prepared with more time. While offering Talamina only two days was worth every minute, it feels like a disservice to myself, and to the incredible place, to try and capture it all in such a short span. But in my defense, I couldn't have known what I was getting into. As for my bike, this little Hawk X250, she didn't falter, not once. Every mile, over 600 in all, was a testament to her reliability. Even as I wrestled to keep as comfortable as I could, she did her job, and she did it damn well. The only question is now, where to next?